um, for the, the opportunity to be here, and in particular, Aras uh, Sedrakin, who is uh, the one to blame for me to actually have <laughs> accepted to give a talk on a subject I don't know much about, which I just started um, some two or three months ago. But I already have a lot of, um, well, some results to show you, and I was really glad um, that um, the first speaker did such a great job, and also the second speaker on introducing the subject, so it will save me uh, a lot of time. Um, but I also um, will switch halfway through um, my talk, uh, if I have time, to actually advertise a little bit of um, the subject that I actually work on. Um, in fact, um, this is, um, these are the people that are involved in, in the uh, work that I usually do, mostly um, spin-orbit interactions and um, topological stuff like myelin fermions and so on. Um, so, in fact, I will, just as an advertisement for the beginning, just switch to this um, view graph here, which illustrates, there you know, there's a purpose to show you first this um, view graph. So most of the stuff that is there is uh, it's related to, I mean, there's something also related to localization here. There's a couple of works that I've done in collaboration with experimental groups of Dominic Zumbul in Basel and also with David Oshlam, which uses weak localization. Um, um, but also, I want to emphasize this work here. If I have time, I'll come back to this set of slides to actually discuss a little bit topological insulating phases um, in quantum dots. Um, and the reason I'm mentioning in particular this paper here is because um, in 2017, I spent six months here in uh, Natal on my sabbatical. That's when I actually got to know many people around here, particularly Ara. And uh, so I start. my student was here, so this is work of a PhD student of mine. So what we essentially showed here is that a quantum dot um, Topological or not, we will have edge states. So it's an interesting feature. There's also some work, and this is part of the digitizing here. So uh, I'm staying here until Wednesday, so I would be glad to talk to you all about this, um, many of these topics here. So there's some nice proposal. It's a very nice paper, this one here, where we coupled a, comp uh, a dot to a Kitab chain, um, and we see some um, leaking of the Mariana mode into a quantum dot. That, that we propose this. I think this is actually a unique proposal in the literature. Um, people you know, that are familiar with the Majorana Fermions know there's some controversy still, whether this zero bias peak is a Majorana Fermion or not. And we believe that this is the way to go if you change the geometry. Usually the experiments are done measuring current along the wire. And we're proposing a transversal sort of geometry. Now. There are uh, also a uh, proposal, also a very nice work, uh, related to 3.5 materials. That's uh, like an ordinary, if you see by the title of this talk, um, I'm focusing on topological phenomena in ordinary materials, like 3.5 materials. Um, also a skirmion lattice in a two sub -end system. Um, this is also a nice work on uh, a spin hole effect, which has some uh, corroboration, uh, experimental uh, verification by a group in, in the University of Sao Paulo. This was done with a colleague of mine, Sacha Kayatsky. Um, and uh, there's also this uh, nice experimental work that we did together with uh, this group in Switzerland, where we um, predict this is so-called stretchable persistent spin helix. Essentially, a, a spin texture is an excited state, if you want, it, a, an excitation on top of a two-dimensional electron gas that is robust. Now, um, what is shown here is a, a density map, you know, two gates, and we can vary the Rajba interaction. At the same time, we can vary the Dresselhaus interaction by changing the density, but we can keep them equal, locked to each other. And that's a symmetry point in the phase space of the, the system. I mean, you know, there's a symmetry associated with that. So 
That means that we can actually create this texture and we can vary the pitch of this persistent spin helix. Um, so I'd be glad to discuss this eventually. More recently, we got also into uh, nodal semimatos. That's uh, the work done by my student as well, Dennis, um, well, Dennis um, uh, Candido, was also the first author in that paper and in this paper. Um, and even more recently, also related to weak localization, we had this um, theoretical experimental collaboration with them, um, you know, um, Catalina Marinescu from Clemson and Dominic Zumbul and his student, Permin Weigele at the University of Basel. So, um, so I'm now go back to um, the previous um, talk. And uh, since I'm here until Wednesday, if any of you is interested in discussing uh, this kind of um, physics, um, I'll be glad to discuss. Of course, being here, as uh, it was pointed out by uh, Ferdinand, it's been quite enlightening because it's a completely different um, crowd. People write on the boards. I even am prepared to write on the boards if you want a little bit. But um, it's been also enlightening because I'm now thinking of all of the systems I've been studying, which has, uh, for instance, which um, is, for instance, a tight binding chain with spin orbit interaction, you know, in this context where I can now add um, disorder and perhaps looking at, uh, looking at um, many biolocalization localization in this system and how, and, how, and how this would affect you know, some of the predictions we have in, say, Majorana wires um, and, and so on. So, um, so let me then, um, given that um, there are many experts in the audience, I think many of my slides are going to be extremely um, um, simple, uh, and I have to say that I actually prepared this for myself, right? It's not <laughs> it was not really for the audience, but rather to organize my mind, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, so perhaps it will help uh, the students and the non-experts to understand or to appreciate some of the more technical things that had been, has been um, already said. So this is spectral statistics. This is the result of uh, you know, the random matrix theory. We've seen this already in a couple of this, the previous talks. I'm just going to summarize um, the results, the sort of canonical results that people have, because this is what is used to, um, in many of the papers that people showed before, uh, this is what is used to sort of guess whether the system is going to be in a many-body localized regime or in an extended or ergodic um, regime, right? So there's all these, you know, words here, integral. I mean, I, I, should I should put quotes all over the place, especially, you know, for the more mathematically oriented in the audience. But it's true that in, in many of this, uh, we're this is going to be used interchangeably to some extent. So an integral system being non-ergodic in the sense that it's sort of stuck because of the, the many uh, integrals of motions. It's sort of stuck in the region of the phase space. It does not sample all over, right? Um, and in this case, is it if you look at the the energy levels by you know doing some uh, diagonalization of the system and then looking at how the these energy levels are distributed, for instance, the the distribution of neighboring levels, um, it's Poissonian or it's exponential, meaning that the levels are uncorrelated, so in this sense. And in the non-integral case, which means that, um, um, so here you have level crossings, right? I mean, that's an important thing that's been already mentioned. If, if, this, if the distribution of levels is Poissonian, it means it's, 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 it's non-zero when, when the level, when S is zero, meaning that when the, level, the levels are on top of each other, they can cross. And that's an important point um, as compared to other systems or you know, non-integral non systems where you have avoided crossings or repulsion, repulsion of levels in a sense. So many of the distributions you've seen from, uh, you see from um, now on in, in the, the, uh, the numerical results I'll show you, you see that uh, we, we can have crossovers between something that is 
exponential to something that is um, um, Gaussian, for instance. And in the uh, small s uh, limit, usually this probability goes like a parallel with different uh, coefficients, different um, exponents here. And the, 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 uh, the value of the exponent has to do with the symmetry or, or the ensemble um, that you're using to describe. I mean, this is a random matrix. Mean, uh, we can go into that later on. But um, uh, essentially, if you have, uh, if the system has some kind of anti-unitary uh, symmetry, like time versus symmetry for spinless uh, particles, uh, this is what is called the Gaussian orthogonal ensemble. And the matrices are described by you know, symmetric real matrices. The beta is equal to one there. Um, that's also, um, this beta is also called, um, uh, it is this exponents related to what we call the co-dimension uh, of the system. The co-dimension means how many parameters you have in a given system to make the levels cross. So in a Gaussian um, ensemble, um, um, orthogonal ensemble is beta 1, that means that the co-dimension is actually 2. So you only have two parameters because you have a essentially a, um, a real matrix. You essentially have the difference between the, the, um, the diagonal elements, H11 minus H22, and the off-diagonal element, which is real. You have two parameters. Uh, now, if you don't have any uh, anti-unitary symmetry, beta is equal to 1. That means that the, your matrix actually is, uh, you have three parameters. You have the two, the difference between the two of the diagonal uh, matrix element and the imaginary part and the real part of the off-diagonal terms. So the co-dimension there is 3, 3 minus 1 is actually 2. So these are all results that are well established in random matrix theory. And of course now <laughs> this point 3 here is the case where we have Kramer's pair. So in this case, um, to look at how this is what they call the you know, sim Gaussian symplet symplectic ensemble. And in this case, you have a minimum of 4 by 4 matrix because you have Kramer's pairs here. And analyzing the symmetries, you end up finding out the co-dimension there, which essentially means the number of parameters that you have free to vary so the levels can cross. It's 5, so beta is actually 4 here. So these are the results um, that are analytical. I also show you next this um, function here. This is the limiting case, but you actually have an expression, an analytical expression for an ensemble of two by two matrices. And um, so this is a general result of, of um, random matrix theory. So for two by two matrices, um, this started a long time ago. This you know started with Wigner in you know late early, you know, last century, in the 1930s or so, when he was looking at the um, level of statistics of excited nuclei, nucleus uh, in the nuclear physics, right? So he developed this uh, technique, and uh, of which we now we uh, understand as the random matrix um, theory. And it's been, of course, a wide range of uh, problems in which it has been applied. So it's possible to show that the ensembles, for the ensemble, for the ensembles I just showed you, the orthogonal one, the unitary, and the symplectic, those are the actually the, um, the distribution. And of course, here is also shown the exponential one. So um, in, in when I show you the numerical results of the model I'm, I'm going to discuss, which is the central spin model, um, we're going to calculate somehow um, probability densities like this, or this which or some sort of probability that we will tell you whether two levels in this um, many levels of the many body states, they are actually on top of each other or not. And the idea would be to try to understand if a given Hamiltonian is in one of these three um, universal classes here. Because there are actually, uh, you know, uh, these are actually universal, you know, class that people call is the three-fold way. And if you were in, um, in, in you know, also in, in, the, in topological stuff, uh, you've probably heard of the ten-fold way, which is, an, you know, now of course people have extended this kind of, uh, there's a new table 
including all of that for the tenfold way as well. So, um, so these are the guiding um, um, principles in a way that I'm going to use when I'm when I'm looking at uh, at the data, right? So, it's been mentioned briefly here um, um, that um, you can you know you can make plots of quantities that you you know, make histograms of. So I'm going to show you, I'm going to be showing you later some plots of probability densities, not for the level spacing, this PS that I just showed you, but rather um, for this quantity here, which I call PR, right? So before, I just showed you P of S. It turns out that to, do, to calculate that numerically, P of S, S is just the difference between adjacent energy levels. It's hard because it actually depends on, on, on complicated ways of, you, it's called an unfolding procedure. You have to define average um, density, of in, uh, density of energy, um, density of states in a, in a given range of energy. And that may vary from place to place. So the, the, to actually determine this P of S numerically is, is not easy because of this uh, sort of uncertainty in how you actually define this average. It turns out that um, some years ago, someone came up with an, uh, an idea um, and that's the, um, the group of Hughes at Princeton. Uh, I didn't cite it here. And I actually apologize since I'm a, a newcomer to this field. Don't get offended if you don't see <laughs> your view graphs there. I actually took note of <laughs> notes of many uh, important works. Uh, and, and I think it's very important <laughs> to, to uh, cite uh, the relev not only the review papers, but rather the, uh, the first papers that actually did the, uh, the, the sort of uh, the important work for the first time. So it turns out that by um, considering um, the, this quantity here, so S is the one I showed you before. Um, now I can actually calculate this quantity, right, which is not very easy to understand what it means, but it, it has a paper in which, you know, for instance, this PRL here. This is all very recent. I think the first guys who proposed this, is in this uh, was around 2007. It turns out that this quantity here is not plagued by the, this problem of the density of states. So the density of states, because I'm taking ratios of these things, it sort of cancels out. So it's more universal in this sense. So people, instead of working with P of S, they work with P of R, actually. So for the ensemble I just showed you before, um, this for two by two matrices, random matrices, I can, uh, you know, it's possible to show that P, you know, corresponding to this um, P, a, P here, the first one, um, this one here, if you, this is the Gaussian, right, the orthogonal ensemble there, that would be this one here. There's a nice integral form that you can convert one into another. That's actually done very nicely in, in this paper here. And for the Poissonian one, um, you get this. So in the plots, eventually when I, when I show you the numerical data, I will have these curves plotted, and sometimes I will refer to them the exponential case or the, the Gaussian case. It's really these two things here that I'm talking about, right? And you can also calculate average values, right? At some point in one of the previous talks, it was shown this, uh, this RGOE, um, right? Or th this is this thing here that you can calculate for this particular two by two um, random matrix ensemble. It's this value here. So, and also you can calculate the same thing for the Poisson ensemble. Right? So, um, by looking at this kind of distribution, whether you know a given model, when we when you plot these quantities, whether it's going to give you a Poissonian ensemble or a Gaussian orthogonal ensemble. Um, what this, this thing is really telling you is whether this system is integrable or non-integral, whether it's ergodic or not, or whether you're going to be in the many body localized phase or not. Antonio. No, I don't know. I know this, all of this um, can be generalized. I mean, actually, there's a very nice book where this is done, and it apparently 
the words that they use there, which I don't believe is, it can be very easily generalized to any, um, it's the book by uh, Hake, maybe you know the name. Um, but I don't know whether they have these results for any going to infinity. No. So um, my one page on many, what does that have to do with many minor localization? Well, <laughs> you know, by now, I hope, you know, with the nice uh, introductory, uh, very nice uh, talk, the first talk by Igor, um, you have an, and also by Ferdinand, I guess you have an idea now what many body localization is, and I think this, um, the usual underso localization is up there, right? Essentially, it's a single particle localization. So underso localization is non-interacting, as has been emphasized many times, and, I, and at some point, people ask the question whether turn your own interactions would change this feature. In fact, you cannot really call this a state of matter. Some people would say that because it's non-interacting. Now, here, when you turn on interaction, you know, if you still remain in this uh, localized phase in the sense that was discussed previously by Igor, and I'm, you know, showing you here um, the same sort of pictorial um, view, is that um, when we think of a many-body uh, wave function, um, let's forget about any phase transition that would take the system into a superconducting phase or something like that. So without any kind of phase transition like that, I can always think of, um, of a, a basis set, which is the uh, Fock space of the non-interacting um, system, which in, in presence of disorder, which include all the extended, non-extended, you know, meaning localized state, Anderson-like, and then you expand your wave function in this basis here. So this is the wave function for a for a interacting system, and it has many coefficients there. And uh, usually, if the system is in extended states, these coefficients here of this uh, many of a huge Fox space, they're sort of uniformly distributed, you know, over there's no particular region of this Fox space in which the square stations are non-zero. Now, the notion of many body localized phase has been emphasized already um, by the previous speaker, is that uh, when you go into this many body localized phase, what happens is that only a few of these coefficients zero will actually be non-zero. So that was actually related to my previous question to, to Ferdinand, as you remember, you know, Fox space means that you know, only a few of these coefficients are are a non-zero or substantial, but that doesn't quite mean it's it's actually um, localized in real space in the sense that we are used to. Right? So this is the basic idea. And of course, people there are, you know works in the literature. I mean, it, the, the literature is so vast; it's really overwhelming. And uh, by now, there are many reviews which helps. Um, uh, one point apparently very important is whether there is many body localization in in the absence of disorder, you know, for, say, uniform system. And there is, the answer is yes. Apparently, you just have to consider two types of particles, but the, you know, one lighter particle and, and, the, and the other one heavier. And with hoppings, like in a tight binding view, hoppings with different strength. So in a way, the heavier one will sort of modulate the other. I mean, this reminds me of, uh, of systems where you have shot noise like wide junctions um, or even double barriers where one rate is faster than the other, you can actually modulate the noise in the system in addition to the already you know, discretized um, um, nature of the charge, for instance. Then you get um, modulation like that. I don't know. I mean, just, you know, I'm allowing myself to, um, to uh, think, you know, wildly here while I speak. Because I think that's the purpose of this kind of workshop anyway. So I think, you know, this is very interesting. And as I said, you know, with now thinking in many possibilities that would happen in system with spin orbit interaction as well. For instance, a Rajba wire with, int with uh, interactions, whether the minimal localization would happen, any effect there. Um, all right. So let's go back then to, to the model I'm going to study. That's the... Uh, the, the model I'm going to show you some results uh, on. Now, 
It's been shown already by the previous speakers. This model, that's the usual Heisenberg model with the random field. Um, this model, if I throw away, if it's just the Heisenberg model, of course it's in 1D, it's integrable. It's solved exactly by the beta ansatz. Um, um, and of course, I actually have an, in, it's, it's an interesting point here when I show you the, the plots, uh, whether I can actually see some exponential um, decay. Right, uh, you know, the ensemble should be exponential in this sense because it's integral. Now, I can also add um, you know, this random field, but in addition, I can add um, a central spin. So there's a big spin, say, doesn't have to be big. You know, in fact, we are going to do a spin one half here, but it's big in the sense that this could be, this could represent a single electron in a quantum dot interacting via the hyperfine coupling with the other you know, um, atoms in the lattice. Actually, people study this a lot in, in the context of uh, semiconductor physics because of the, uh, the decay of the spin for, uh, for a qubit. So qubits, one of the platforms for a qubit is essentially a confined electron in a quantum dot. So and but of course, because of the hyperfine interaction, the spin of the electron and the quantum dot can interact with this path of spins, and you eventually have to include a term like this. So this is the Hamiltonian then that we're going to consider. Um, all these the, the terms that you know the, the term you know defined here, and there are some limiting cases as I already mentioned, right? When um, this two are zero, or when this two are zero, this is also an integrable model, right? And in addition. And uh, we have this uh, property here, which is important for the numerics, right? So the Z is actually conserved. So when you do numerics, you organize your matrix in blocks so that it's easier to uh, order or to um, classify, to order your um, states. Now, we're actually writing a paper on that, so don't feel bad if you don't see your name there. <laughs> we're really going, <laughs> go we're going we're gonna to go revise this anyway. Um, this this is a very uh, the, the thing about this field is that it's so it's moving so fast that you know it, I think it's really amazing. Uh, so this paper here came out um, I think last month or two months ago. Oh no, actually last year at the end of the year. It's actually very similar. It's treating the same kind of system that we are with looking at other things. For instance, entanglement. Uh, this the question of it, whether you have you know um, the area law or or the volume law to define you know, many body, uh, a many body localized phase. All right, so what you're going to see next is essentially some um, numerics, some distribution, this PR. You can think of it as P of S, right? The distribution of how the levels you know, are close together or not. Um, and of course, we plot P of R because numerically it's uh, it's a, it's a, uh, easier. You know, it's it's not plagued by the problem of the density of states, right? So um, that's what we have. So these are, you know, as I said, these are data that have been produced as uh, essentially as we speak. We've been uh, we started this business, you know, um, um, in around March. So I should have mentioned that um, John Schliemann, who is a uh, good friend of mine and a colleague, and also is at the University of Regensburg, where um, Ferdinand this. So he spent some time earlier this year with us. That's when we started this business. Um, I mean, of course, he's been working on related subject for some, quite some time now. So we've been learning a lot from him. And um, in fact, these two guys here are actually spending time in Regensburg. Maybe Ferdinand already met them, maybe not. But they've there since uh, a week ago. And I'm going to join you guys soon. Um, so what is shown here, what is shown here is, um, first of all, this side here, I put A to 0. So that's the center spin is not there. This is just the, the, the Heisenberg chain 1D with random fields, right? And we just bend, you know, this uh, made histograms, right, by counting how many energy levels fall on top of each other or not. And as you can see here, Remember, H here is just the random field, right? Random field, we take it to be randomly distributed between minus 
you know, some value and plus some value, just like the Anderson kind of uh, disorder. So you can see that starting um, from small disorder, 0.1J, the system is certainly, in the sense, ergodic. It's not an exponential. The black part here, right? It's not an exponential. The red curve that you're seeing here is the Gaussian orthogonal ensemble, right? Um, and then as you increase a little bit the disorder potential, it sort of moves into, to f you know, it seems it fits very well, right? This two here. And then you keep increasing. And eventually it moves away from this Gaussian ensemble again. And eventually, for a strong enough disorder, you can start seeing this thing moving into uh, an exponential type um, law here, right? And of course, it's been already mentioned that finite size scaling in this business is going to be, it's tricky, right? You have this moving crossing point that I'm going to you know, show next, something like that. But also, from what I learned from Ferdinand's um, talk, um, this turn, <laughs> this uh, upturn here is something that it's everywhere, right? I mean, how far can we go to actually say that this is really exponential? I have no idea. You know, maybe if I increase some more, uh, and then if I blow up the scale here, I, there's always some upturn there. But the conclusion here, in the, on this side here at least, so this is the Heisenberg chain, right? So it's clear that you see that for small disorder, you have some kind of deviation from the Poisson type distribution, PR. That would be the Poissonian distribution. Red, you know, this green here. The green is the same, or, or, you know, it's not plotted here, but there should be a green here and also there, right? And then you have level repulsion. So when you look at this graph, this depletion here, it's sort of linear, right? It's the depletion here means that the levels are not lying on top of each other. So that's an evidence if you, if you want to say that the system is um, ergodic, right? And then it sort of moves to an uh, intermediate phase where you actually may be dis well described by this. And then eventually you go away from this phase and you go into this, um, we would like to call it the many body localized phase. Because this is a highly disordered system. And it seems that the, uh, we still have a, a distribution of levels that follows an exponential law. Now, the same thing is done here, but now with just the central spin. So it's just the central spin um, and, and, you know, interacting with the hyperfine, right? So, and then, of course, with the random field, but we throw away the interacting part of the Heisenberg model. And you can see sort of um, similarly to this, um, but not quite, is that uh, this intermediate um, um, non -er intermediate ergodic phase here does not quite fully develop because uh, like here, like here you, you have like this sort of nice fitting, right? And here it sort of never reaches it, but then it, it already crosses over to maybe the many body localized phase. So, oh yeah. Yeah, yeah. This is th this is actually very. You know, th these are all very good points because actually, even before I answer this question, you could ask, um, what about can I actually plot for h zero, h equals zero? Can I get an exponential? Right. I mean, actually, this is the question I ask my students, right, uh, recently. And apparently, numerically, it, it's it's a, it's a point in the phase space which is integral. It's known, right. And I think it's related to the beta and that solution, that you know it's an exact solution, but maybe there's it's a non very non-analytic or something, and you cannot really get there. Now, here, what happens when you do it numerically for h equals zero, the Heisenberg, is that you have so many degeneracies that you cannot really, you don't really know how to deal with that. So, for h equals zero, I would love to be able to plot an exponential here, to actually see an exponential, but I, I don't. Now, when you put this order, whether you have, um, maybe your question has to do with this, um, these uh, local integral motions, you know. Okay. 
with the disorder. Okay, well then, fine, that's fine. Well, what this is showing here at this, in this part is something funny, right? Because this is not integral in the sense, numerically in the sense that it should give me an exponential <laughs> distribution. It's not, so I don't know. Yeah. Uh, so that's why, as I said, I like to use the integral and non-integral re, you know, with respect to this many-body localized states with, with codes. I don't really know, you know, and in fact, uh, as been emphasized, has been emphasized before, um, this local integral of motion business is something that's been de be being developed as we speak, essentially, and I don't think it's actually very clear how to actually construct these um, conserved quantities in a way. And, and of course, I, I'm saying this to, in fact, you know, get my uh, train of thought um, um, going, because the way I think, at least in terms of the many body localized phase, is essentially um, in, in when, I, when people call it integral. I like to think in terms of this integral, uh, local integral um, quantity, lo local um, conserved quantities, um, just the same way as we think in, uh, in uh, an integral system, right? Which is, it's it's um, non-ergodic, essentially because you have this conserved quantity somehow, locally. So the system cannot freely move around and uh, sample all of the, uh, the phase space, right? So yeah, so I don't know. As I said, these are all very uh, new. Um, and, um, and, and what is even more surprising, but this is, I think, well known in random matrix theory, it's surprising to me when I read these papers, is that <laughs> this comparison here uh, with the, uh, the Gaussian ensemble and also with the exponential, uh, with the Gaussian in particular, it's for a two by two uh, random matrix uh, ensemble, right? It's not for a large system. And, but that's apparently a well known result in, in, in random matrix theory that uh, things work surprisingly well for small uh, ranks of the matrices involved. You know, as Antonio asked, you know, the n goes to infinity. Apparently, you know, people do away with even n equals two. Not everything, certainly. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So this is actually beyond me. I don't really know whether you know. Maybe someone can actually explain that. You know, why does it actually work in some cases? I don't know. No, this is this is it's running actually. But yeah, it's running. No, I will show you next. No, I show no. I, there's some more data, but just wait. Great. Um, all right. So this to to you know flash a few slides of um, of what is known. It has been already shown, I guess, by some of the speakers, right? And also this one, which is a sort of important. These are the numbers I showed you here, right? You can calculate those too. Finite size scaling is complicated. This is also the paper I mentioned from um, Witzburg, the group of Bjorn, Todd set out, uh, where they actually do some um, scaling um, for this uh, exactly this kind of system. And of course, there are all questions of you know, ETH and, and, and things like that. Now, this is uh, let's do some simple scaling in a way. So I'm going to throw away this, and um, I'm going to look at um, so n here. Is this a distinction? And k is the uh, it's the number of Heisenberg spins plus one, which is the center spin, right? So in the previous slide, if you notice, I had 16 Heisenberg spins, and on the other side, I had 15 Heisenberg spins plus one. So I was comparing things with 16 spins. Now I'm doing some kind of scaling. We'll do some very primitive version of scaling here. Um, so it's the same now, but I now, I now only have the center spin model, right? And uh, I do it for this three. And on a good day, if you're nice, you can say, well, yeah, you know, it seems that I, as I increase the number of spins, this sort of transition here, right, from here to here, here to here, sort of gets sharper to some extent. I mean, I don't know. So let's plot this in a different way. Um, so that's essentially... Um, what we concluded before, right? At some point, there's some kind of crosses, you know, crossover between some kind of ergodic phase here and this 
non-ergodic or minimally localized phase there. Now, I will plot this. Um, I will look at this uh, quantity here. You can think of this again. It, this R is that quantity I showed that is uh, essentially the ratio of the max of Sn, Sn minus 1, and Sn in the min of Xn and Sn minus 1. You can think of this in a way as, again, the levels bunching or not, right? So this is plotted for the three cases I just showed you. And as usual for, you know, um, kind of the preliminary thing you do when you do finite size scaling, you plot the quantity, which is plotted here, as a function of the disorder. And uh, because near the phase transition, if you believe in critical phenomena in this business and everything, you have the uh, correlation length, you know, diverging and, and, and eventually near the near the uh, the transition, I can rescale things and um, and and hopefully, uh, if you see some crossing, that's an indication that maybe this is the critical field, right? So this is a very preliminary result. I'm not claiming this is the correct. Um, critical field, but we identify from this point here by I something which is like 0.8. So we still have to, you know, re risk do proper finite size scaling, but then maybe you run into difficulties because this thing is shifting as has been shown shown previously. Um, so, but this is this is it. So, um, and up here is essentially plotted delta R, which is the variance of this uh, distribution. So, unfortunately, I don't really have data to show you when we have both J and A together. This is, you know, it's coming up next, you know, maybe next year. <laughs> so, I'm going to go back. Um, I'm g this is a good point to, to stop, and if you have anyone have any further question. Otherwise, I'm going to quickly go over, if I have time, the chairman will decide. Three minutes. Um, okay, maybe it's time for question then. Yeah, and then I can, uh, if there's no question, I'll, I'll do some advertisement of the other kind of works I, we do. Okay? All right. <laughs> Sorry, you wonder what? Can you speak louder? <laughs>